So greetings everyone and I have the absolute privilege and pleasure to be sitting with Freddy Silva, one of the leading experts in the new thesis of an ancient civilization and has done so much work around the world, has an exquisite array of books. He is now working on his seventh book, which has just released Scotland's Hidden Sacred History, along with a number of others, including The Missing Lands and The Lost Art of Resurrection, of which I am particularly interested in as well. We plan to go on a pilgrimage together, a literal pilgrimage. Freddie's just returning from the magic of the portal of Egypt, and I am on my way to India. Both of us have met in connection with a dear fr mutual friend, Helen Tomey, at the Sacred oh. Earth Journeys. And so we want to just thank her for all her unbelievable efforts in making some of these pilgrimages actually really possible. Mm -hmm. But it's a delight for me to sit with uh, Freddie and pick his brain a little bit about how he got here, what he's putting forth, the timing of all of this right now, astrologically, the significance of the ancient wisdom, and also the application of everything that he's offering right now. So let me start, Freddie, by just thanking you so much for carving out a little bit of time for us today in your schedule. Congratulations on the new book and also the documentary. And I actually, in preparation for this, saw quite a number of your documentaries. So you, you really are a tour guide, you're a researcher, you're a, in a way, you're a mystic because you're tapping some very, very ancient knowledge and uh, a documentary filmmaker. Uh, what got you started on this whole adventure, Freddie? I was drawing pyramids when I was three. That was a sign. <laughs> I got sidetracked. Uh, I mean, I was uh, like things which didn't seem to add up or made sense. Uh, I never, even at a young age, I never really accepted the way the world was taught to us. And it kind of stayed with me until I went through my commercial uh, career, 14 years. And then I decided that just the commercial world just wasn't for me anymore. I was making tons of money and uh, I was finally miserable. So I took a left turn at Albuquerque went off researching crop circles and wrote uh, a best, an international bestseller on the subject, uh, which is, still is, by the way. It's just being re-released uh, this month on its 20th anniversary. So that kind of set the whole bowl rolling. It gave me the confidence to go and do what I really wanted to do and make a living doing it. And I haven't stopped touring in 20 years. So something's going right. It's incredible. You know, those left turns, they make all the difference, don't they? So what age would you have been when you made that departure in Albuquerque, so to speak? What what, what age would have that been in your in your biography? Oh, well, uh, physically, it would have been 38. Uh, and uh, But it, it started before that. And, I, and looking back with hindsight, it's kind of interesting that uh, I was, was getting fired for having a conscience. I was working as a creative director in advertising, uh, not far from where you live, actually. And um, I just said, there's moments where you sit at home sort of looking at your navel and thinking, you know, why is it that I, I should be doing better with my life uh, given <laughs> what I preach and uh, the, the, the values for which I stand and why am I getting uh, so castigated for this? And then I just took a leap of faith. I just uh, decided to go off into the uh, fields and uh, start investigating and just having a good time. And, you know, one by one, you have these spiritual experiences and otherworldly experiences, which you cannot explain. You don't even know they're even possible until they happen. And that gives you confidence to believe that there's something else looking after you. And then you have to take that big leap of faith. You know, as uh, uh, Bernie Taupin once wrote, uh, Elton John's lyricist, you know, you, you reach the, the bridge, you have to either cross the bridge or fade away. And I decided mm. to cross the bridge. Uh, I mean, what else is going to happen? You either end up miserable or you at least die trying. Uh, I'd rather die trying. So far, I'm still trying, and I'm still quite alive. Yeah, it is a remarkable. It's a remarkable act of courage, right, to follow your intuition into the dark night, not exactly knowing where it's going to take you. But there is there is something. There are angels, in a way, sort of guiding you along. And I imagine once you really oh, yeah. give yourself over to it, you've you've had quite a magical ride. And you know, if you didn't want to hold back right now, like what, when I say the word angels guiding you, what what kind of what do you make of that? Oh, the management, yes. Um, and they, have a very, <laughs> they have a very strange sense of humor. That's the one thing about it. Uh, no, I, I met the management very early on in my career uh, as a researcher. And uh, it really, again, I, I was not expecting any of this. Uh, I was actually researching crop, crop circles. I was 
getting very close to understanding how they're put together, who's behind them. And then one day I'm actually levitated inside one of them. I didn't think that that was possible. I got taken out of body and I can still remember seeing these people surrounding me. And uh, later on, only about three years later, I started to uh, put, make the connection that the crop circles and ancient sites are one of the same thing, mm. built originally by the same group of people who are now no longer in physical form. And uh, it was one of my first experiences in the Great Pyramid. I saw the same people coming out of the stones in total darkness, uh, as clearly as I'm seeing you right now. So those two events by themselves just kind of shape you uh, because you realize there's something else going on here. And I'm being supported. I, uh, you know, my mission was always to, you know, put this information forward into the public domain so that more people could be aware that there's a bigger picture going on here. And mm. if it happens to me, an ordinary person, surely it can happen to other people. So my risk, sort of relationship with the with the management uh, is very <laughs> physical. I actually call them real people because to me, they're very physical, just as we are in our level of reality, but in their level of reality, they'll be on, you know, FM 1 million. You know, we can't even begin to understand where they exist, but they portray and they show themselves to us in a way that's, in a way that we can understand. And that was one of the things I discovered very early on. They said, this is not how we actually look in our level of reality, but in order for you to be comfortable with who we are and to, for your brain to understand who we are and what we look like, we uh, show ourselves in a way that's comfortable to you. And it's also culturally uh, changeable. So if you're in Ireland or in Persia or in China, mm. they'll show themselves in a slightly different way to accommodate for that cultural thing. So I thought that was a, a, a wonderful way of, of communicating and they're always around. Uh, they're always... I, I, I give them credit for being the foundation for the work that I do because it's like any musician would understand this. You have this inspiration, this idea that comes out of nowhere and you wonder where did that come from? Mm -hmm. And you follow the trail, you trust the process, you don't know where the roadmap is or what the roadmap is taking you, but somehow you end up getting there. Uh, and that's what drives me with these people. So it's a very personal relationship. And I think everyone has this relationship if you just care to, to follow it. Now, Freddie, do you, do you do you do you have any sense that they're? Um, I mean, what would you say to your critics who say this is sort of an archetypal or unconscious manifestation? That these are archetypes in a sort of Jungian way versus the fact that there may be external agencies. How do you how do you how do you uh, how do you respond? Oh, I think it's external. Yeah. Uh, I think that there's an oversoul as well that uh, surrounds you. I mean, you're just a, a vessel, uh, and your soul is basically housed in this vessel. So that's the first layer. Uh, so you can always say it's an archetype which your soul is trying to use as a way to give your brain an idea of understanding what it is that you're receiving from another level of consciousness. Uh, that is very much true. And it's kind of goes around the Jungian model to a certain degree. Uh, in my experience, there's, there's, there's another experience, and that is that there's another level in which there's a lot of sentient beings that exist and they are more than happy to help you because, mm. and I quote, uh, we know how difficult it is to uh, choose to incarnate in a physical world where you are limited by your physicality. And the paradox is that you spend all your life reading books, watching videos, going to lectures and going to sacred sites to understand the nature of who you really are. Mm. So it's, it's a bit of a, a, a cosmic joke. Uh, mm. uh, as Dante once wrote, you know, it's this wonderful uh, device where you try to be part of this divine comedy. So for me, it's, uh, and for many people that I've encountered on my journey, these people are very, very real. Uh, they ex ex uh, inhabit another level of reality, which is parallel to ours. And they're more than happy to assist if we just ask them, but they're not going to provide the answers. That would be easy. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just going to give you the uh, the goalposts, and you have to kick that ball for the goalposts yourself. Otherwise, yes. there would be no purpose for you to be incarnated in the first place. Yeah, in, in the tradition that I come from, Tibetan Buddhism, there certainly is this idea that there are external agencies, and, and not all of them are actually, you know, all that, you know, uh, ben, ben, beneficent. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to be careful, in other words, with these agencies. Have you ever, you know, how did you work in your initial contact with the management? How did you work with any fear that may have came up? And, and then how do you discern who you're dealing with? And do you have any stories where it didn't go so well? <laughs> no, it's always gone very well. And I mm. think it's a matter of trust uh, and gut feeling. I always feel very uh, supported. It's like a family that I want to hang out with during Christmas and I never want to go home. 
Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, it's that kind of feel because my intent was always for the search for truth and also for personal development. That's always been the, the clear aim. And I think once you set that aim, whether consciously or subconsciously, you attract the kind of entities that will help you further that aim. Now, if you come from a very negative stance or you happen to believe uh, in uh, negative alien deities like greys who from what I read, are not particularly nice people. Uh, mm. They're very confused entities and they like to experiment on people and animals because they have no idea where emotion comes from. That's their biggest uh, problem. They're trying to understand how humans and animals function. Uh, so if you go in with that kind of uh, idea and that kind of desire, then you will connect with that kind of entity. Mm. But from my personal experience, it's always been very positive, very guiding. It hasn't always been um, simple because otherwise it would be too easy to get on with life. Uh, you have to do the work yourself. They mm. do just give you stepping stones. You have to actually follow that path and step on the stones yourself and sometimes you slip and fall off and you get back on again you know the trick is not to make a habit of falling off the stones and keep going but i've always felt very guided uh, in my uh, work because and again seven books and 13 documentaries later and they keep expanding yes. i look back on the body of work and i see how much of it has actually helped people in a very positive way and that really comes from working with the people uh, that i again that i call the management who are essentially feeding me a little bit of information that then I have to do the research to complete the dots. So I felt nothing but uh, good vibes coming out of this. And I think it, it, it really comes down to your gut feeling that uh, you, you, you just have to learn to trust. Mm. And you kind of use that gut to say, I feel good about this or something about this doesn't quite add up and it smells and you walk away, you know, uh, I, it really comes. It's a very simple process for me. So wonderful. I mean, it seems, seems like the word that's coming up for me is a, a, a trust and alignment. I mean, yeah. if, if, you, if you have a good integrity and a good motivation, then, then like meets like. And so you get guided in this way. And, you know, the proof is in the pudding, as you, as you say, a very large body of work. If I could ask you to summarize to date, you know, in, in, for, for, per, for people who might not be as familiar, how, how would you summarize the body of work, what it is that you have try to encapsulate in all your documentaries and in your writing uh, and even in your pilgrimage leading I mean because you're trying to then enter a smaller group into an experience but yeah, yeah. in your own words how would you sort of encapsulate to this to date what what your body of work really represents I think it represents an ancient system of knowledge that's, uh, that's what it essentially comes down to uh, there's nothing really new that I'm doing uh, like so many people uh, of my kind who are trying to achieve the same purpose and that is to bring enlightenment to people who are looking for that enlightenment and we're actually living the enlightenment and then showing how others can follow in that path. Uh, so it's part of a very, very long tradition of people who've done exactly the same thing, uh, going back to Plato or uh, even Alexander the Great, um, the invisible brotherhood in the Middle Ages, the Rosicrucians, we're all part of this long mm. lineage of people who are trying to do the same thing. And just like the Tibetan mystics as well. Uh, they, I was, in fact, I'm just reading a book on Tibetan mysticism right now, uh, uh, coincidentally enough. And I'm watching the parallels to what I do in my own work. So I'm just using the same effort using different words. But it really comes down to, at the end, uh, it's about self-empowerment. Uh, so if I use myself as the blueprint, uh, I've watched myself grow over 20 years of my work from what I used to be to what I am now. And it's through my experience and my own research and the body of work that I've created that I become the person who I, that I am. And then I can become an example to others. I'm not trying to convince anyone to do anything. I'm just showing these are the facts. This mm -hmm. is what's happened. Now you choose how you want to go ahead with this information. I'm not here to convince you of anything. And I think that's the best thing you can do. You know, it's a bit like Gandhi said, you just be the change you wish to see and just mm. let things fall where they may. So that's really what it comes down to. It's about the idea that you are becoming self-empowered through experience and also through very uh, verifiable information. And the, you know, the thing that I, I see in your work, and may, maybe there may be just two or three others that come to mind, sort of pioneering this, this uh, assertion that the civilization story or narrative that we are compelled by in sort of modern day and mainstream is is but a half truth and that the story is much longer and you know the sort of narrative that you know somewhere in the fertile crescent around you know the period where there's a transition between uh, hunter-gatherers and the uh, rising of 
city-state, there is this sort of explosion in high culture that happens that we're so, so sort of just take for granted. And, you know, your, your assertion is that, that that is just one chapter and it has been preceded by many, many other, you know, chapters. And, and yeah. I'd like for you to just comment on that, because I think therein will we'll develop a little bit of a, a, of a new narrative that will then position your new book. Because I see your book as just another, you know, you know bit of bread in the breadcrumb trail. Like I, I sort of feel like with each book you are, you know, also sort of combining a kind of meta narrative of a of a lost civilization and more particularly than a lost civilization, a coherent science about the soul that then gets expressed in 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 what seems like disparate cultures, which I find so fascinating, this sort of universal spiritual technology, high art of the uh, soul's resurrection uh, that is kind of lost in time. But if, if you have a third eye and you're being guided by the management, maybe you can start to connect dots. I see your work as a vast collection of dots creating a new picture of our history. So please lead us on a little taste of that. <laughs> and it wasn't even planned, by the way, uh, which is very unusual for a writer. I usually plan these things out uh you know meticulously and none of it's planned it just seems to come out in a very coherent way which is what i like about it uh because a i can't make it up as i go along i'm literally being led by the information as i find it and the more important thing is to ask the local people about their perceptions so most of our history especially in the western world comes from a european background uh, especially in the Victorian era, it's been shaped by that uh, by that assumption, and a lot of it has also been backed by the Catholic Church. So there is a bit of a, a constraint around the thinking, which gets us to the 21st century, and now we're realizing the picture really is a half truth. Um, and a lot of it is very political, uh, politically controlled as well. Mm -hmm. So when I was researching the material for the missing lands, I wanted to ask the question. What is it about all of these stories from indigenous people around the world that they talk about a parallel civilization when they were hunter gatherers living in caves, you know, without clothes, um, you know, eating animals, eating each other. And suddenly you have these stories from New Zealand to South America to China, Japan, Mesopotamia, all around the world talking about a parallel group of people who are exceptionally tall. They were very light skinned. They were blonde, blue eyed, red haired and green eyed which drives a lot of woke people crazy, by the way. Uh, I, I get accused sure. of being a racist. Racist, but, yes. I mean, yeah, your, but that's not your, really... your critics. Yeah, what do you say to your critics who say that that's a white narrative? Well, I just uh, I, I just point out that I'm not quoting this from my point of view. I'm quoting the indigenous people mm -hmm. around the world. So when the people in Polynesia who are dark skinned and look very different to myself, when they start addressing this and they're saying, no, we're not talking about Europeans. We're talking about a race of people that were here long before Europeans showed up, like 10,000 years before Europeans showed up. And we were very comfortable with them. It wasn't a colonizing thing. It was an exchange of information. And these are the people that gave us the moral codes, that gave us the, the accoutrements of civilization. And the, um, uh, uh, the phrase that they used is, they were human-like, but not quite human. Mm -hmm. And I hear that a lot. So again, it's uh, turning the whole thing on its head that we shouldn't be looking at this information from a current political or... Um, political correct point of view uh, we're looking at this from an age-old structure that comes from indigenous people we let them talk uh, their story because we never get to hear about it and that's what makes this story so interesting the fact that i'm in new zealand listening to uh, words that are of armenian origin mm. from where a group of such gods originally came from who then are found in south america by a different name who are then found in easter island by a different name who then are found in japan in central america and that's how I began to piece together the whole story, that we are living here with a group of people who ran a parallel civilization that was already on the wane 12,000 years ago when the Ice Age struck and it finished most of them off, along with most of, of uh, the hunter gatherers too. And when I was reading a lot of the uh, stories around the Pacific, which I still think is one of the oldest places on Earth, that bit where there's hardly any land, all the stories that seem to come from the Pacific Rim or the islands that survived the sunken continents, according to the local traditions, those are some of the oldest traditions I've ever read. Uh, Mesopotamia hmm. almost is like a something that's brand new. They don't even care about Mesopotamia. They keep talking about the Pacific Rim and how everybody got around in, uh, in ships and as easily as you and I go shopping for a can of baked beans at a supermarket. So looking at all of these stories, it was able to, I was able to put together this coherent 
uh, dialogue that really talks about a group of people who really uh, were masters of nature. They knew how nature works, could bend it at will. And then, and sometimes they didn't get it right either. I mean, they were, they did have sort of uh, writing chivalry as well. Uh, there were these moments where the gods were attacking each other. So they fell for the same problems that we have here. But on the whole, most indigenous people were very comfortable with them. They were very accepting and they look up to them as being an example of how to live a very good life. And that's what helped us sort of string this whole story together. Yeah. So what are we, what are we going to call these people? What, you know, they go by different names. Give, give us a few of, 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 the, of the local uh, um, terminologies across culture uh, for the name uh, of this civilization, we want to call it. Oh, I wouldn't even call it a civilization. I think they were just a group of, uh, a, like a sisterhood and a brotherhood. They were, they were connected by about eight islands. They lived on island nations. They were very adamant about, about staying away from human beings. And I suspect that they knew that they had something that hunter-gatherers didn't, and they didn't want to interfere with the natural development of another culture. Uh, just like we would show up in, you know, in uh, New Guinea, in the mountains of New Guinea, and we interact with a culture that's still walking around without clothing, and they have no hierarchy. And at that moment, we've interacted and we've distorted their natural direction. I think they were very careful for that. Uh, so in South America, it was Vida Kosha and his Hai Hai Wapanti. Uh, there'll be a test on this, by the way. Uh, and it me literally means, in Aymara, it means the shining ones, which, of course, are the sa is the same uh, acronym that was given to the um, followers of Horus in Egypt, who also arrived in Egypt in 10,500 BC. There was an agricultural revolution along the Nile, and they were called the uh, uh, shining ones, followers of Horus, which is then the same nickname as the Anunnaki, the people of Anu who lived in the Armenian highlands, who always get very negative press, and I don't know why or who started it, but it, the story is completely different to what you get to hear, especially on ancient aliens. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you have the, uh, the other name that they were given was the people of the serpent, which I find all the way through India, the Naga people, for example, mm -hmm. uh, which goes through Tibet, Nepal, and also China, Tibet, yeah. dragon li uh, lineage, the mm -hmm. Japanese divine kings, which are also part of the Naga um, civilization. They appear in Central America as the people of the serpent. Uh, uh, called the um, uh, Nakul, and also, now I'm going through all these dead languages in my head, <laughs> the Kanul. And then they appear in Portugal, uh, ironically, at the very foot of the mountain where I was born, which is very weird, called the uh, Ophusa, the people of the serpent. And I always wondered, what's this about? Well, it turns out that the people of the serpent was the nickname given to anyone who had control over the laws of nature, which by and large are electromagnetic. So essentially, you're giving uh, face to two forces which are invisible, electricity and magnetism, which always flow in serpent form. So if you are a person of the serpent, it means that you have learned to control these forces and you can apply and bend them at will. And this, of course, is reflected in the uh, mythologies. So these are just some of the names uh, that were given to them. There were also the Urukeu of Easter Island and New Zealand. Mm. Um, and that's just a tip uh, on, on top of my head. There's a whole bunch more. But essentially, when you figure out what the names mean in the local language, they are one of the same thing. They're either the red-haired people, shining ones, or people of the serpent. Wonderful. That's, well, that's, a, that's a great encapsulation. And, and then sort of bring us back to the uh, timeline now sort of the uh, the current narrative versus the narrative you're proposing. How far back are we, are we imagining? The one that survives uh, in bits and pieces around the world is just before the end of the Ice Age. So we're talking about 10,800 BC when we uh, the Earth is hit by some something very large. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's stories from China all the way to Central America where the Earth stopped rotating. And at one point, it began to rotate backwards. And this is picked up in... Uh, India and also in Egypt. So these are some of the oldest things which can now be validated by astronomy. Uh, and also we have the exact impact points of incoming meteorites, especially off the coast of America. We have the, what we call the Carolina Bays. <coughs> Sorry, a bit dry in here today. The Carolina Bays, which are these uh, massive uh, meteorite strike points from North Carolina all the way to Florida. And you can still see them from an airplane today. There's thousands of holes uh, which look like little eye shapes, which shows that, that the direction of incoming projectiles from the northwest of the American continent. Now, this sets off the uh, the Younger Dryas, 
And it's at this point that we start picking up all the mythologies. And uh, this leads us, of course, to the Great Flood of 9700 BC, which is when the Ice Age collapses, again, due to what they call burning mountains coming from the sky. So mm. these poor people, they only didn't just go through one cataclysm, they had to survive another cataclysm within about 900 years, so within a, a few generations. So they're already preparing for the next cataclysm and they were setting up outposts all across the earth, which is why these stories survive. Amazing, and so what, what, <clears throat> what kind of major critique are your critics ledging against you in terms of this particular narrative what's the what's the single most you know challenge that you face and that you've had to navigate against this sort of perspective i don't that's the funny thing uh, they'll, start <laughs> doing, they'll, they'll start doing personal attacks which is a good sign that you've already won the argument and there's, <laughs> there's, there's no evidence it's all mythology yeah but mythology are eyewitness accounts they're just written in a way that make, to us they look like fairy tales because the language that was around ten thousand years ago is very different to our language uh, mm. Just as you're trying to explain something, uh, a story in Persia to someone in France, you don't quite get it the first time. You've got to look at the metaphor and the symbol before you understand, oh, of course, this makes perfect sense. So a lot of the, uh, uh, the information really uh, the attack comes from the uh, archaeologists because they, they're, they're like their vendettas. Uh, they, you should see what they do to each other, let alone what they do to people who are not part of their club. And right. this is an established fact. If they just spend some more, some more of their time researching uh, and integrating other people's work, they'd actually get along further than, like we are. For example, I mean, I ask archaeologists, I ask historians, I ask geologists, astronomers, astrologers, psychics. I bring in every single facet of information so that on my desk, I can look at all of this and go, wait a minute, that gives us a better mm -hmm. foundation from which to stitch this story together. And when you stitch the bits together, they all overlap. That's the strange thing. Mm -hmm. So from, when you're looking at it from one specific point of view, let's say archaeology, they're very much focused on pottery shards. They love their pottery shards. And unless you have pottery shards, you have no civilization, let alone that, you know, if you and I were sitting here right now, I dropped the pot accidentally, moved on. That pot was covered by debris for thousands of years. They were able to figure out the entire civilization for the fact that I dropped the pot on this particular land thousands of years ago. You can't do that. I mean, that's just such a myopic way of looking at the world. And what I love about this work is that nobody has the answer. Lots of people had bits of the answer, but only by sitting back and looking at all of how all of these things intertwine, mm. you do begin to see that there's an overlap. Uh, for mm. example, uh, Robert Schock, who's a good friend of mine, a great um, a geologist, uh, he was looking into the uh, near Earth uh, scenarios of uh, end of day destructions, and he wrote a lovely book on it. There's been 13 near end of civilization scenarios since the uh, Great Flood. So this is a recurring theme. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you sort of sort of put his information on top of the astronomical data, you begin to realize that there is a relationship. And when you look over the geology and then mythology, you begin to realize all of these things are providing a very good snapshot of any point in time. So it's very important to maintain a very open mind and mm -hmm. see what everybody else is saying and what they're bringing to the table. And that's what keeps the critics away. Mm. Talk to us about Gobekli Tepe as a as a as a as as an as an, as an evidence of this uh, prior timeline, extending the timeline. Well, that's Gobekli Tepe is very interesting because we'll never get to the bottom of it in our lifetime. Uh, there are at least uh, uh, sixty five oval stone circles in that hill. The whole hill is artificial. We've only just dug maybe 5% of the whole thing. But structure D is very important with these wonderful pillars, the T-shape uh, pillars with the engravings, uh, the T being the breath of God in every ancient culture. That's what the T-shape means. Now, there are some very interesting uh, carbon-14 dates there because when you look at the wall that's been built inside the actual structure, you realize that the wall has been built after the fact as though it's protecting the original sacred site. Mm. And it was done very carefully. And the first time I looked at this, I thought, someone has built this to protect the site as though they are, you know, and then they're infilling the, um, the whole thing with dirt, but very carefully. They didn't just dump trash into it. It was very carefully filled in as though they're protecting it from some major uh, upcoming catastrophe. 
And they expected to come back and dig up the whole thing later. Well, of course, they didn't. And I uh, stuck my neck out before the third carbon-14 test came out. The first ones came in after the uh, the Great Flood, uh, you know, the Younger Dryas. And I said, this isn't right. I bet you if you get go right into the actual debris inside the wall, you're going to find an earlier date for this. And sure enough, we have 10,200 BC, which is very close to the date also given by the mythologies in Egypt about a, pro uh, a vision that was prophesied by one of the pharaohs of these burning mountains coming down and destroying the whole globe. Uh, and the same story, by the way, in Noah, in the biblical Noah uh, flood story, which is based on the Sumerian tradition. So we have that to go on. Now, every monument on the face of the earth commemorates its date of construction by whatever it is looking at the sky. So if you're standing in structure D, you're looking behind you, there's a hill. So you can't quite see what's going on because the stars are obstructed. But if you look at the two main pillars at, at, towards the north, in the winter solstice of 10,450 BC, you have a perfect match for Vega, the pole star of the period, right in the middle. Now, turn right behind you. You have pillar 51, 52, and 53, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's a test of memory here. Uh, they offer you a perfect view of an unobstructed horizon. And if you sit there very patiently between these two massive central pillars, like two blinkers, you will see on pillar 51, the first rising of Orion's belt on the spring equinox of 10,450 BC. You will take 50 years. The uh, next pillar gives you the midheaven position and the third pillar gives you the setting. Now, why is this important? Yes. Because at the very same moment on the Giza Plateau, the pyramids are commemorating the same date. And other structures are also commemorating the same date around the world. But the thing that connects all these stories together is the fact that all of these gods that we've been talking about, every one of them, without exception around the world, are always associated with Orion and specifically the belt stars of Orion. Uh, even the Maya talk about the, uh, the, the center of Orion, and especially the M42 nebula that sits just below the belt as being the heart of the universe. It is the place from where everything comes from, all creation, even human beings, mm. which is interesting because NASA has just admitted that M42 is the biggest star forming region in the whole universe that they can figure out. So how this do they know this? So Gobekli Tepe essentially is commemorating a dating time and it gets stranger because the original name, which is Portasar, it's an old Armenian name, literally means the umbilical cord of Osiris. Now, what's Osiris doing it in, uh, in uh, Southern uh, Turkey. Armenia? Well, all you have to do is go to Egypt, which is uh, and Giza, which is the... Uh, uh, Giza is essentially the, um, the doorway of Osiris, the plain of Osiris. So one of those moments where I think, I'm going to give them credit for this, where the management drops this image into my head of drawing a line between the small pyramid, the corner of the small pyramid, going to the corner of the big pyramid. And I thought, Okay, I can do that. I've got very accurate uh, maps. And you draw a, a chord between the corner of Mankaro's pyramid and the one of Khafre, uh, and, uh, sorry, Khufu, and you end up exactly at Gobekli Tepe. There's your umbilical cord of Osiris. The two sides are connected to each other geodetically, but also in terms of myth and also in terms of name. This is fascinating. So I'm just going to help, help help me just build a little bit of narrative, and then we'll 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 shift it to Scotland because that's the most recent uh, area of your research to sort of confirm this underlying meta narrative. So we've got Gobekli Tepe. Just give it a date for me quickly. The earliest carbon fourteen dating so far is about ten thousand two hundred fifty BC, and it's commemorating um, its its alignment in the stars as below, so so below a um the orion's belt at that time uh, the first rising of orion's belt is uh, just before that 10450 bc okay 10400 bc and then so you had want 200 years in which to play in, before they realized oh uh because they're great astronomers they could track what was going on in the sky this is why these monuments were built with huge rocks to survive until our time Almost as if they're trying to say, you've got to keep track of the sky. You've got to keep track of where the earth is in space because there is a periodic um, a killing of civilization and humans will perish too, but not all of them. Uh, luck favors the prepared. And we know because we've lived through this. So every monument, when it's constructed, always commemorates a specific date. The tough part is figuring out what is it looking at. 
So the local mythology is also connected with the, the people of Orion, which is essentially the uh, people of Anu. And uh, so that gives you a clear reference. And sure enough, those three pillars match the exact rising of the first time over the horizon of that constellation, just as it does in Egypt. And then would you add uh, something in Central America or South, South America? Would there be a Mayan equivalent of something like that? Yeah, pre-Maya, uh, there was the people called the Its that no one ever talks about. In fact, I'm about to do a documentary on them. I find them fascinating. So we have Quetzalcoatl, we have Kukulkan, and then we have Itzamna. No one ever talks about Itzamna. He's the most important one of them all. But they were all people of the serpents. And I suspect that one of these three may have been the Quetzalcoatl, and by the way, it was a, a title, not a name. There were many Quetzalcoatl, which drives historians crazy. Um, he, the original guy, may have been responsible for the original alignment of the Teotihuacan complex, because that also is an exact mirror uh, for the bell stars of Orion. Again, 10,450 BC on the winter solstice on this particular occasion. Okay, great. So now we have three temple complex in three different locales, all aligned in terms of the astronomy and the astrology. Let's now get into the uh, metaphysic or the spiritual utility of these sites, the ritual use, and in terms of the sort of utility, the, the rite of passage that they may have served in terms of its resurrection or its um, sort of transmutation of the psyche. Talk to us a little bit about the utility of these sacred sites. I know that you're a big proponent of the energies in these uh, particular sites, such as the, um, the, the, the tombs in Egypt. They're not sort of ornate and decorated. These, are, these, were, these were most likely sites where some sort of rite of passage were undertaken. They were practical utilitarian sites. Mm -hmm. Um, so give us a little, now that we've sort of gone the, the big picture and we've seen some consistency across the planet, we see that there's an ancient civilization carrying, bearing an ancient knowledge. We see the cataclysmic impact of the meteorite and the sea rise level destruction, probably via sea voyaging, a, a great migratory sea voyaging capacity allowed them to uh, spread this knowledge into various aspects of the planet. What is this knowledge and its particular use for individuals? It depends on the site. Uh, some of these have multiple uses. Some have specific uses. The one I've tried to focus on is the ones, like you said, which are quite boring, actually. Like the King's Chamber is a very boring place, but it's the most perfect building you ever walk in or the most perfect room you'll ever walk in one day i'd like to go there with you actually Freddie. oh i was just my, like, be, uh, a week be, ago <laughs> it would be my pleasure it is an incredible experience it's like being in the body of god it's the uh, the octave uh, by the golden ratio the height is the golden ratio the box is a, is a mirror image in smaller uh, in scale so you have to whisper in there and you it, it, the whole place just reverberates back so it's a very functional site and anyone that i take to the valley of the kings to show a real tomb you can see the difference that there's a tomb where someone's buried and the other one is a metaphoric tomb where mm -hmm. nobody's ever been buried or ever been found mm -hmm. and uh but it's a, uh, like many places of its kind it's a very interesting way to um uh, they, they, they fulfill a function which goes back to this concept of the lost art of resurrection, as I call it, uh, which is to do with this initiation, which as far as I've traced uh, back, uh, it goes back to uh, Japan in 8000 BC. That's the, that's the earliest mention of this. Uh, it was uh, formed part of the 17 ways of Ise, which is another version of Isis in Japan, which is a very interesting uh, place to find Isis. And there were 17 teachings. Uh, each one of them uh, showed a different uh, uh, portion of yourself and how to master yourself in relationship to your soul, but also to nature and the cosmos in general. Uh, whenever you find this number in terms of temples like the Osirian in Abydos or uh, Kenko in Peru, they all have the same number of rooms, the same number of niches, and they performed exactly the same right. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I've always focused on is, is what were they up to? What were they doing in these places? Because they always had this wonderful local folklore of people leaving uh, this world and appearing three days later. And they're declared mm. risen, reborn, or raised from the dead. Mm. And this precedes the uh, guy that we know quite well in the Western world, Yeshua ben Yosef, otherwise known as Jesus, by thousands of years uh, to the point where in India, uh, there's a guy called Mithra who was doing exactly the same thing. 
And the, uh, the whole initiation, as far as I've worked out, in a nutshell, they started off, uh, it, it was a free uh, uh, period of training. Uh, first of all, you'd go into these mystery schools, if you were curious, and they would observe you to make sure that you were a, a responsible character and you had integrity, uh, because this information, when properly improperly used, could do all kinds of terrible things, not just to people around you, but the world and also to yourself. So they would give you basic truths in the first year. The second year, they will give you deeper truths, uh, what the uh, metaphors actually mean and how they can be applied. And then the third year, oh, this is a good period. This is where you are trained in order to leave the body, have an induced near-death experience and come back from the other world to tell the tale. Mm. Except you couldn't tell the tale because it was forbidden by law. You had to apply what you learned and never talk about it. That was the big thing. So the final uh, resurrection used to take place on the spring equinox. So the church has got the whole thing backwards. The initiation began on the spring equinox and it ended in December. So it was a nine month gestation period, just like the female womb. Yeah. And you would learn about uh, the tricks to keep your focus while you're crossing into the other world. You, in Egypt, in fact, there was one tomb, of, well, tomb that we go into of Tutmosis the third and we're the only group to get access to this by the way I don't know uh, who I paid off or who <laughs> likes me in the Valley of the Kings my, my group is the only group that goes into this chamber and it has the 473 phrases that you have to remember so that when you left the body okay mm. this is an induced near-death experience it's bloody dangerous mm. uh, you've left the body physically and you're now being distracted by all kinds of discarnate uh, people, things mm. that you've never seen before. And of course, you're confused. You want to make sure you're not afraid. You want to make sure your focus is going across this bridge of forgetfulness. And you want to make sure that the three days you spent on the other side are spent very well, extracting information, collecting information from specific people, and then finding your way back into your body. And then you're taking out very groggily, you meet Venus rising before the spring, uh, before the sunrise, and you're declared raised or risen or uh, risen from the dead. So that was what was going on in a lot of these chambers associated with this particular uh, mythology. It was literally a self-help uh, experience where you come back and recognize that you are <laughs> as a god. You know, these are the self-help. Are we going to call that self-help, Freddie? <laughs> I do. Uh, because you know, and that point was We're, people keep. That's basically it. enlightenment. I mean, it's dying before you die in order to be fully awake and alive in your life. I mean, exactly. There, is, there isn't a greater spiritual teaching on the planet. Exactly, and even in Tibet and in India, they still refer to these people as the risen, and everybody else are the corpses. The people who just go you know, around there each day texting, watching television all the time, completely unaware that in between birth and death and a painful life, there's nothing mm. else. So, yeah. yeah, still going on to this very day in specific parts of the world. And it's amazing. It's reminding me of um, uh, the Immort or Immortality Key by Brian Marescu's new, new book on the uh, Gnostic oh, and, uh, and, the, and the Dionysian uh, and also the uh, Mystery Schools of Greece who basically used a psychedelic potion to induce a near-death experience in order to reclaim consciousness, in order to expand consciousness so that there's a greater sense of living while alive. Exactly. Seeing something that cannot be seen. This is the motif, the universal motif of the rite of passage. And so, I mean, this is a fantastic, uh, you know, entry point now into your latest book. So please give us... That with that motif in mind, what you found in Scotland? Oh, lots of yummy things. First of all, no one knows where the megalithic culture from Scotland comes from. I was completely amazed by this. I have to so, say, I have to plug your documentary because it's one thing to read the book, but it's another to have those stunning images of those steles well, and of those those uh, those monolithic structures, the caves, the temples. Um, but also that landscape. I mean, it yeah. just is awe-inspiring a landscape. But that was it an eighteen-mile tunnel from one point to the other. That cave, I know. out of I, out of I, which I, the uh, the the Venus. What was it? The Venus point at the at the at the rebirth of the cave was aligned. I mean, please just give us a little taste because it's just so juicy. It's amazing, isn't it? And uh, I, and I actually have the scars still to prove that I actually found it physically. Uh, I lost my footing when I finally found the mouth of the cave, slipped on some algae and 
got trapped upside down between two boulders with an incoming tide. Uh, I don't know why I'm still alive or how. I think I just learned to control my fear and was able to move my center of gravity eventually and get out of there. But uh, it was, uh, I traced the story back to a Rosicrucian who I believe was one of the early uh, Scottish Rite Masons in Scotland. And uh, he was talking about this ceremonial cave and it was supposed to go in, you know, into the belly of the earth mother, like an umbilical cord. Then you come out the other side completely risen. I thought, wow, that means you'd have to go and cross the whole of the Isle of Mull for 18.6 miles. And I mean exactly 18.6 miles, which just happens to be the numerical value of the lunar cycle, which of course, all the temples dedicated to this um, uh, initiation are governed by a lunar goddess. And I thought, what are the chances of picking of all the caves in the whole of Scotland? And it may be part of a lava tube, which may have been adapted by human beings. Uh, of all the, uh, all the chances they pick one that actually did the specific uh, the trail numerically that's incredible and then you have to align it to the equinox sunset that's your beginning so you're at the bottom of this cliff which is about 1500 feet vertically above you second oldest rock on earth and there's this tiny cave entrance when you walk in it's like St Paul's Cathedral it's a big dome on the inside and you can still follow the trail for about 200 feet now because the sea level has risen since the time this was used um the sand keeps getting trapped further and further back into the cave, which means you, it's now blocked at the rear. But when I'm reading the original text from the 17th century, uh, this guy called McKinnon actually describes features which are now no longer seen in the cave. So it's quite clear he was you know, only 300 years ago able to progress a considerable distance away. The other part of the story was finding out, well, I can't get, I've got the entrance, I've got the uh, part of the neck, the only other way to prove this story would be to find the exit. And of course, it goes exactly uh, on the same level as the equinox marker. Oh and I mean, exactly. Gosh. So there's a two degree variation at that latitude, which is perfect. And there is a cave on the other side of Mal called the Cave of the Young Maiden. And there's no story about a dead woman or a woman who lived there or anything. And I'm thinking, right. well, of course, the maiden refers to the maiden that you marry, that the initiate marries when they have achieved that connection to the other world because yeah. she represents the divine mother that represents the whole wisdom in the universe. And she can only be married in a dark recess. That's why you have the image of the black Madonna in Europe. She is same, in, but, same in the Tibetan tradition, that's Prajna Paramita. Exactly. The wisdom goddess is voidness. She is the emptiness of, of reality. She's the openness of reality out of which everything is born. Exactly. You marry this divine bride. It's a story of the Arthurian uh, Grail quest as well, uh, rewritten for a different era in the Middle Ages. So, yeah, there you are. The cave of the, the uh, young maiden is the exit to the, this incredible tunnel. So Scotland is full of these incredible stories, but they seem to go back to uh, a very old tradition of people who I was able to trace uh, to uh, the Armenian highlands. And there's a lot of Armenian language in Old Gaelic, which is why this uh, book would become so fascinating. I would never have put those two things together. So we have stone circles in Scotland, especially in Orkney, which has the most beautiful stone circles of all, uh, named, uh, uh, named by uh, an Armenian uh, group of people. And they tell you exactly what the stone circle is doing. So mm -hmm. the ring of Brodgar, the ring of Stenis, uh, Bukhan, all of these places, even the, um, the stone circle of Kalanish, which means the, uh, the stone cross on a ridge in Armenian, which is exactly what it is. Um, all of these things led me to the, the stories about this group of people in Ireland, which back then, Scotland and Ireland didn't exist. They were just geological entities when they, the two were almost inseparable. And there was a group of people called the Tuatha de Danann that used to be the mythical race of giant people that uh, came there. Very tall, light skinned, blonde, blue eyed. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. We've heard that I somewhere before. Trail back to Ukraine, uh, ironically, Bulgaria and Romania. They were called the Tuatha de Danu back then. And they were part of a divine bloodline that had originally come around the Black Sea. And they originated as the Anunnaki of Armenia. And there you'll find the original stone circle, which is um, uh, Karahunj, which looks exactly like the original uh, lost brother of Kalanish on the Isle of Lewis. So the two are literally sisters of each other, separated by a huge track of time. So and the, the thing that really blew my mind was that the civilization didn't go from France up to the south of Britain towards northern Scotland. It went around Britain, started in Orkney, 
And then it went south to Lewis and south to Ireland, where another group of people met up with them who came from Sardinia, Malta, and originally from Armenia. Also mm. the same people. So there are two groups of migrating magician priests that brought the um, sacred uh, knowledge to Ireland and Scotland. I did not see that one coming. Wow. Wow. What, what kind of confirmation is it at that point for you personally? Let's leave aside the metaphysic, the uh, the astronomical. What is it like for you, Freddie, when you're on these adventures? You've followed the breadcrumb trail. You have a large body of knowledge behind you. You have your spiritual guides above you. Uh, but even you, at every step of the pilgrimage, are walking into the unknown. You don't know where that cavern is going to lead. You don't know where the breadcrumb trail is going to lead. What's it like, Freddie? Just give us a little you know, personal little uh, insight. It's a bit like walking around like a child. Uh, I mean, really, I don't expect anything. Uh, I think people go to these places expecting something and they will be disappointed because it won't happen when you're expecting something. These things happen when you're not expecting anything. You just accept that something's going on, which is greater than yourself. And it's always that sense of wonder. I walk into these landscapes, I take my notebook and I'm observing, making notes, and I'm hearing uh, stuff going in the back of my head. Suddenly I get flashes of inspiration. I draw things down. And the whole picture just suddenly appears. Uh, it, it is a magical experience being totally integrated into the landscape and following in the footsteps of people who literally were described as magician priests. Mm -hmm. So, but that's just my experience because that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for these uh, validations that will help me to show others that yes, there is a body of knowledge that you can draw from that will make you better than you are right now. It, it's an expansion of your own consciousness. And if I can do it, you can do it too. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm no one special, particularly. I'm just like anybody else. I'm just looking for, for my particular journey. But the beauty of it is that you're going there with a blank slate and slowly the slate gets filled with all of these little breadcrumbs. And then you have to go to libraries and research it and put some science behind it so that the skeptics can be brought to the middle ground. Because it's easy to talk to people like you and I. The hard part is to convince people or well, at least get them, uh, people who are skeptical to see that there's a different uh, version of events going on here. And if I can do that, I've done my job properly. Yeah, and that you've done it so well and so beautifully and in so many across mixed media, which I think is very helpful. Honestly, the photographs are stunning. The well, film yeah. the film documentaries add a whole nother dimension. Uh, your eloquence as a lecturer is, is stunning. Uh, and so you have a very rich way of articulating a central thrusting message, which I think has very deep implications and impact. Let me then now bring us full circle uh, through the conversation, given the time is short. And uh, we are now amidst a metaphorical n n sort of global near-death experience given the pandemic and now given the war that's raging, which has implications with the supply chain of food across the planet. We are, I would suggest, a very potent astrological time of reboot. And I wonder if you have any, you know, sort of broad um, recommendations, suggestions, if there's a particular, what I've often done on the podcast with people who represent various traditions is invite them to share with us some of the mythology that may be relevant to the time. Mm where we are right now you know from an astrological perspective we are in some sea change between the piscean and the aquarian i think i wrote you once and asked you what was going on with the ceiling in there at dendera and what kind of astrological significance it might teach us are there any kinds of mythology um, that might be really relevant to prime us or prepare us or allow us to see the symptoms of covid of the pandemic, of the great sea change that's happening around us, just to alert us and to open up that third eye? Oh, I think these things have been around forever. I mean, I was just reading a book to uplift me called 1665, uh, and uh, it talks about the worst year in living memory in Britain, specifically London. Not only did they have bubonic plague, which wiped off a third of the population, once they were, got up from uh, their uh, hovels, they realized, wow, that was close. Then the city burnt down. Uh, so they had, a, they had it worse than us. We've had worse, worse catastrophes on Earth, but they're getting closer and closer and closer. And I think if you look at people like the, the Maya, who also predicted this era as being a great portion of change, which is 
kind of uh, all on the back of the Indian predictions as well, uh, as in India, not Native America. Uh, although the Native Americans also have a very similar explanation, but the Maya are very clear on this. Uh, we're in between uh, two worlds. Uh, we've, we've run out of this last world, which we've explored to its nth degree. We realize what can be worked and what doesn't. And now we're beginning to fall apart because we need to move on to a new experience because life is about an experience. We've completed the experience, and now we have to get, get on to a new experience. And everyone panicked about 2012, and the Maya just laughed at this. They said, mm. no, it's not the end of the world. It's like watching a Volkswagen engine reach 99,999. It goes to zero, but the car still works. It still keeps going. And they said, there's actually a window that's going on here. There's a 60-year window, 30 years either side. And if you, if you reach a critical mass in consciousness on planet Earth, which does not mean 51%, by the way, it's a lot less than that. And we're pretty close to hitting it, by the way. Um, the critical, uh, once you reach a critical mass, you reach that point where things move forward. Now, we've gone past 21, tw uh, 2012, and the window is now closing uh, we, we, to 2042. And the point is that if we don't do it by ourselves, nature is going to basically demonstrate that change is upon us and the changes are going to be much more cyclical, much more connected, and they're going to be much more destructive. And there's no, I mean, nowhere where you go in the world, even in Northern Scotland, even New Zealand, where I go to quite regularly, you see climate change really at work at the extremities. So we are being forced to look at ourselves and how we work with culture, with civilization, with systems of uh, everyday function, which are all falling apart because, well, they're unsustainable. That's why. Mm -hmm. And any physicist listening to this will understand because they know there's two things that happen in the universe. There's order and there's chaos. And it's, uh, as soon as you reach a state of order, it already starts to defunction into chaos. And once you reach total chaos, it starts rising to a new level of order. That's the wave of the universe. But the more systems in collapse you find the greater the potential jump to a new level of order and that's why i find this moment not just frightening but also potentially incredible because mm. if we think that the world really is in total chaos and it really isn't it's a matter of perception really uh like in new york for example where you are it would have seemed like the end of the world was two years ago and uh, everybody's moved here to portland maine by the way from new york uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, the culture is going up. Uh, but um, it, it sh uh, it's really showing that we cannot maintain this level of culture forever. Uh, we've done it. We've seen that. We've got the T-shirt. It doesn't work the way we're going. And in order for that system to break down and re uh, reshape itself into a new system, we have to go through more chaos. But we don't have to go for it if a greater level of people jumps uh, and wakes up to this sort of new resurrected being and realizes we can do better than this. And I think that's where we are right now. We're questioning and everything. But sometimes when we don't get the plot, nature will force us to reevaluate uh, re what we're doing. Yeah, and I think that's so beautiful. And it's very consistent with the way I've been thinking also as a, as a, a these two sort of the synchronicity or the, the dis dissolution is also on the heels of a regeneration. So the systems are breaking down, but if you look carefully across the board, whether it be the, the economic system that's plummeting right now, fiat currency and, and mass surplus where inflation, I mean, there's also cryptocurrency and decentralized value and also a, a, a bartering. When I was just in Bali and people were hit by the massive loss of tourist industry and they, they went back to their villages, they know how to do the old school way of sustenance they know how to farm they know how to barter they have this thing system called banjar which is local authority which means they don't outsource their power to big government they have centralized like more more cohesive smaller group uh, 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 governance self-governance all of these are old wisdom emerging in the in the squeeze of the crisis and it's happening politically. I think it's happening in the medical sector too. I mean, we've outsourced our, you know, health and healing to big pharma, but in comes the psychedelic movement. And, you know, so if the idea is that we are in the sea change and we have a choice, the choice is to let it engulf us or to wake up. Exactly. Then it also, it also assumes that, um, given the fact that we've come full circle after all, you know, sort of the, the narrative that you've spent your entire career articulating, 
it would seem that the mystery schools would also see a resurgence at this time. Yeah, and it began pretty much just before the Second World War. And specifically in Britain, there's a sort of a new age movement that kind of uh, knew how the connection between us and the other level of reality works. And it's almost like they sent out a cry for help. They, they could foresee big, big problems coming only four years later uh, with the rise of uh, fascism. And uh, the universe, the management heard this and they sent back information, which is interesting because a lot of my teachers the people that I idolize, which are most of them are now dead now, uh, they were at the forefront of writing some of this stuff back in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, John Michel, one of my main uh, tutors, uh, he was a genius. He knew everything about numerology, about ancient systems of knowledge. These people paved the way for people like myself. So we're now expanding on, the, on what they built. And we're now coming to a point where this information is really going to be useful at times of great change. And in fact, um, I made this sort of uh, intellectual leap of imagination when I was finishing The Missing Lands about the irony of where we are right now with total climate catastrophe, the total dysfunction of economical systems, where the gods were with the same problem exactly on the half cycle of uh, the, the great year. Yes. And I mean, we literally are in the half cycle since the great flood. Is it 26,000 years or so, the great year, 25 something, 25 right. and change? It's about that, yeah, about <laughs> We're 12, right there. years ago, right yes. on the mark. And uh, they were faced with the same problem. They, they, you know, the total annihilation of the planet, someone has to survive and whoever survives picks up the pieces and we restart civilization. Well, we are now at the same point in time and I'm looking at uh, what NASA releases every week. Another um, PR release about another incoming asteroid that we didn't know was there. Another potentially life-threatening piece of rock just went past the earth only two weeks ago. And it was pretty close, uh, size of a big bus. So I'm now realizing, wait a minute, this, this idea, this obsession with the sky that we have and how we can blow up meteorites with atom bombs and things, we have the same obsession that the, uh, the ancient gods had with protecting the planet and making sure that this survived. And I've met with people in NASA and they said, it is ironic that we are now having the same obsession with near earth objects that they had 12,000 years ago. And perhaps this time, we are a little bit wiser to understand how to turn the whole thing upside down and maybe work it to our advantage. Mm -hmm. And this is where people like the transcendental movement comes in and people at uh, Princeton Research Anomalies Department comes in because they were measuring the effect of human consciousness to influence local events. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you remember back in the 70s in Washington uh, and Chicago and I believe Detroit, there was a group of transcendental monks who meditated on lowering the crime rate and the, statistically they actually succeeded. When right. they left and they moved away, boom, the crime rate went up again. Same thing happened at Princeton, where they actually monitored the uh, influence of a group of 20 people sitting around a computer that was dishing out a computerized drumbeat. And they were able to alter, using the power of intent, the uh, structure of that drumbeat. Now, what could we do as a consciousness if we suddenly were faced with projectiles coming out of the sky or a great uh, civilization ending catastrophe. I think we now have the answers, ironically through technology, to show that human uh, intent and the power that we have within us collectively can alter the shape of our reality. So we're, we're kind of back where we were 12,000 years ago, but now we have the chance to be the gods we've been waiting for all along. And I think one of your, you know, one of the, the hallmarks of, of your legacy will be that you've revived You've spent your precious human life, as they say in the Buddhist context. You've you've you know committed and made an offering of reviving some of these mystery schools for this time. I mean, because what what good is it simply as a a rendering in a book or an inspiration as a documentary if we don't take the next step? And what I like about the universal aspect of all these cultures is that it doesn't mean that you have to. You know, it's not one tradition or the other. If they if they share a common heritage, yeah. and it's mystical and it's personal, it's decentralized. And it's not about the Catholic Church; it's about the the purity of the the spiritual transformation, and that can actually happen in a Hindu yoga context, in a tantric Buddhist ceremony. It can happen in the island of Bali. It could happen in New Mexico. It could happen with peyote. It could happen in so many contexts. Once you get past the rigidity and the Sorry. ownership. Uh, and you see the, the the universal personal opportunity, 
uh, then then maybe people can intersect in ways that are more local for them and meaningful for them. But the but the the grand result of people embarking on this spiritual opportunity means that the collective resonance of the planet can be upgraded. And I think that's the real message. And that's for that, is. for that, uh, you know, if you have any parting words, I just want to thank you for being part of the Wisdom Keeper podcast because really that is what exactly what you are. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. If all else fails, drink heavily. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to have a bit of sense of humor about this. It's like uh, the Dalai Lama has 49 phrases about, you know, uh, uh, becoming a better person. And they're all very serious, of course. They're very mystical. But the last one, approach cooking and love with reckless abandon. I thought, <laughs> absolutely. And you've got to have a little bit of a... A little twist with all this. You can't take it too seriously, otherwise you lose yourself. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Miles. And an honor. And if you do you have any updates or uh, upcoming activities that you want to plug? Because I think people will want to intersect with your work if you if you uh, you know other than your new book. Uh, where are you going next on your next adventure? I'm trying to get to, to Ireland, Sardinia, and uh, Portugal. I want to build, uh, do a bit more research and set up a couple of tours there as well. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the price gouging with the airlines has gone through the roof where even yes. Uh, yes. premium economy is $8,000. So I think I might just sit at home and uh, write a few more documentaries and polish up a few things. Um, I've got the 20th anniversary of Secrets in the Fields, which is being released literally this week. Uh, on crop circles, there's always a huge demand for that book, and it's being uh, people are selling copies at six hundred dollars, which is ridiculous. Uh, and also uh, plugging the Scotland book as well, which I, um, I, uh, I'm very proud of. It so again fills in another as, uh, area that uh, we knew so little about, and also about the history of Ireland, which is very interesting. So there's always something going on here, but just go to my website; it's uh, all packed with information. Uh, you, you you'll be there for a week. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. I'll make sure the links are all below. Freddie, thank you for your time. Thank you for your amazing contribution, your good cheer. I hope to have a nice drink with you at some point. And if not and if not a wee drink of some sort at some point, I'd love to be in the heart of that sacred temple, the, the pyramid, uh, and enjoying the vibration and going through a pseudo rite of passage, if not the full-fledged experience. So uh, all best to you. Until next time, thank you so much, Freddie. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Wisdom Keeper podcast. If you've enjoyed this presentation of sacred knowledge, kindly like, subscribe, review, and share our podcast and video series on YouTube with your network so that more people can benefit from these teachings and together we can create a brighter future. If you're interested in my online courses, our community membership, and pilgrimages I lead, consider visiting the Contemplative Studies program at gradualpath.com. Until we gather again, all best wishes.